everyone uh, welcome to this first lecture under the module 3 uh, in this lecture we will discuss about the energy from biowaste feedstock in that we will discuss availability of the feedstock composition analysis and properties of feedstock and preparation of fuel pellets using bio additives what is biowaste feedstock biowaste feedstock includes non fossilized biodegradable organic material from plant animal and microorganism this includes varieties of material such as agricultural and the forestry byproduct residues and waste as well as organic components of industrial and municipal waste agro based feedstock includes the food grains and food grains here means the waste grains that are not consumed or used for food purpose also it includes the agricultural residue refer to the various type of organic material left over from agricultural production after the crop or other agricultural products have been harvested and this includes stalks straw as well as seed hulls husk nutshell and the manure from specific sources terrestrial and the forestry residue includes the wood and wood waste so here the wood waste refer to the organic material that are left over from the forest harvesting and the processing activities that is mostly bark and sawdust which is by product of the timber production and the non food plants the aquatic feedstock here includes any plant material that has formed in water like macroalgae microalgae seaweed water hyacinth etc and the waste here means the municipal solid waste the waste from paper mainly in the form of the cardboard food yard and the plastic waste these feedstock materials are transformed using suitable transformation process or system to produce either transport fuel chemicals or usable energy that is heat or electricity as a product so this is about the bio based feedstock these bio based feedstock material can be transform into different forms of energy product using various processes to produce solid fuel for co firing to generate thermal energy or heat energy and electrical energy to produce transport fuel as an alternative to conventional fuel that is diesel and gasoline it can also be used to produce chemicals and these chemicals can act as a feedstock material for bio refinery three main types of fuels which can be produced from this bio based feedstock includes the liquid fuel that is mainly ethanol biodiesel methanol vegetable oil and the pyrolysis oil the gaseous fuel includes the biogas and the main composition of the biogas here methane and the co2 producer gas consist of the following composition and syn gas solid fuels includes the charcoal torrefied biomass bio coke and the biochar so these three main types of product can be produced using this bio based feedstock material however for the sustainability of this biomass conversion processes the feedstock must be economically viable and environment friendly therefore suitable feedstock need to be selected based on its availability so that it can be used further in the energy conversion system so let us discuss about the availability of the feedstock material at present biomass is a primary energy source or fuel for domestic use in many developing countries primary biomass sources are categorized into two main type that is virgin biomass and waste biomass 
virgin biomass is available as it grows but secondary or the waste biomass being a derived product is not available immediately moreover the availability of the biomass is also influenced by its accessibility constraints because biomass is a dispersed and possesses low energy density compared to that of the conventional heating fuel such as coal or fuel oil because of this much larger volumes of biomass are required to supply the same amount of energy which can be made through limited source of conventional heating element that is coal biomass is not available at one place in a concentrated form and this creates a logistical issues energy transportation through biomass is much more expensive than that through the oil gas or coal and therefore the availability of the locally generated biomass is crucial for the biomass conversion process or system so the example of the fresh biomass are shown here that is terrestrial biomass and the aquatic biomass waste biomass as shown here being a derived product these are not available immediately that is a agricultural waste forestry waste municipal waste and the industrial waste so these are not available immediately whereas this fresh biomass are readily available these bio based feedstock materials are classified into four groups that is herbaceous biomass woody biomass aquatic biomass and waste biomass herbaceous biomass here includes grasses straws and other residues so straw here basically originate from the agricultural residues and grasses mainly includes the bamboo cane switch grass miscanthus etc the straws like wheat straw rice straw these are the agricultural residues and other residues in the form of fruit shell husk hull grains seed these are generally the waste generated during processing of the agricultural produce woody biomass includes the wood and the wood waste including stems branches bark lumps sawdust and other material from various wood species aquatic biomass as i mentioned earlier it includes any plant material that has formed in water like marine or fresh water algae macro algae and micro algae seaweed water hyacinth etc and the waste includes the municipal waste biosolids sewage sludge industrial waste and various manures from specific sources so let us discuss about this bio based feedstock materials one by one herbaceous biomass herbaceous biomass originates from a plant that have a non woody stem and which die back at the end of the growing season and this herbaceous biomass includes most agricultural crops and grasses including bamboo and wheat straw in general the herbaceous biomass will have the higher nutrient content and lower lignin content than the wood materials because of this heterogeneity in the class of biomass herbaceous biomass is variable in composition because as you see here there is a lot of heterogeneity involved in this class of biomass and because of that we can observe a great variation in their composition energy crops also belongs to the herbaceous biomass that is poplars willows switch grass corn soybean canola and other oil plants so here the agriculture residues of the soybean and canola crop would be utilized for the energy application and not the seeds structural and composition analysis of the herbaceous biomass indicates that herbaceous biomass are a rich source of carbohydrate and starch these herbaceous biomass contains higher amount of carbohydrates that is cellulose and hemicellulose than lignin if you see this particular table here the lignin content in the herbaceous biomass is relatively low compared to the carbohydrate content and in general the herbaceous biomass 
will have the higher nutrient and lower lignin content than the wood as just we discussed one or two slides before that the herbaceous biomass will have the higher nutrient and the lower lignin content. Cellulose, hemicellulose and the lignin are the main constituents of the herbaceous biomass thus also called as a lignocellulosic biomass. So, according to this table here it appears that the herbaceous biomass contains higher amount of the carbohydrates than the lignin. So, this particular schematic here it compares the structural constituents ratios of various biomass feedstock material from cellulose to lignin ratio and from hemicellulose to lignin ratio it appears that the herbaceous biomass contains higher amount of carbohydrate compared to miscellaneous biomass and the woody biomass and that already we have discussed uh, one slide back that the herbaceous biomass are a rich source of the carbohydrate and starch and that can be evident from this particular schematic here that the herbaceous biomass has literally higher cellulose to lignin ratio and also higher hemicellulose to lignin ratio compared to the miscellaneous biomass and the woody biomass. Similarly, this schematic here it compares the H by C and the O by C ratios of various fuel feedstock in that if you take a look at the biomass sample only. So, here the cellulose shows relatively higher O by C and the H by C ratio compared to the woody material and the lignin has relatively low O by C and H by C ratio compared to the cellulose and woody biomass. Similarly, the proximate analysis of this herbaceous biomass it shows a great variation and that is mainly because of the specific type of a biomass. Since this herbaceous biomass includes the biomass of different varieties right from grasses to agriculture residues as well as to the energy crop. So, large variation is expected in this kind of a biomass material. Herbaceous biomass typically has a higher volatile matter content and the highest volatile matter content is around 87 percent in the herbaceous biomass and that is mainly due to the lower density and the higher carbohydrate content in the biomass sample. And this volatile matter content makes the herbaceous biomass more suitable for the fast pyrolysis or the gasification processes where the volatile matter contained in the biomass can be converted into liquid fuel or gaseous fuel. Some species of the herbaceous biomass shows higher fixed carbon content and even the maximum limit here of fixed carbon content in the herbaceous biomass is around 35 percent and this is primarily due to the lignin which is a complex polymer that contains a significant amount of the carbon and that contributes to the fixed carbon content in the biomass sample. Similarly, the ultimate analysis of the herbaceous biomass it shows high carbon and the oxygen content and as we discussed few slides before the lignin has lower H by C and the O by C ratio whereas the cellulose has higher H by C and the O by C ratio and since the herbaceous biomass has more carbohydrate content than the lignin. So, this higher cellulose content and the lower lignin content indicates higher H by C and the O by C ratio for the herbaceous biomass. So, the next classification is the woody biomass. Woody biomass here includes the non herbaceous plant material which live for longer time and they stay on the ground with its stem and this woody biomass it includes a non herbaceous plants which are not seasonal and they live for a several years with their stem above the ground and this category of the biomass it mainly consists of the material such as the stems, branches, bark, lumps, sawdust and the sawmill residues and it also includes other sources of wood species including the trees and woody shrubs. 
structural and the compositional analysis of the OD biomass indicates that the OD biomass includes different component mainly cellulose, hemicellulose and lignin in its composition. And this type of biomass is called as a lignocellulosic biomass as the major part of the biomass is lignocellulose. Lignocellulosic material is the non-starch fibrous part of the plant materials and if you see here the cellulose content in this particular type of biomass it is relatively low compared to that of the lignin whereas lignin content is relatively higher than that of the cellulose in this type of a biomass. Carbohydrates are mainly the cellulose and the hemicellulose fibers which impart strength to the plant structure while the lignin it holds these fibers together. As compared to the herbaceous biomass, in the woody biomass the lignin content is typically higher as I mentioned just now whereas the cellulose content is slightly lower in the woody biomass compared to that of the herbaceous biomass. And even the proximate analysis of this biomass it shows a large variation in composition and that is mainly due to the large variation in the species of the woody biomass as well and typically this woody biomass it tends to have the lower volatile matter compared to the herbaceous biomass mainly is because of its higher density and the lignin content because in case of the woody biomass the lignin content is relatively higher than that of the herbaceous biomass and hence this kind of biomass are preferred for thermochemical conversion processing compared to the other biomass sources and it also makes a potential raw material for the slow pyrolysis or combustion processes for heat and power generation. And if you look at this particular table here, the volatile matter content in this particular biomass is relatively low than that of the herbaceous biomass and the highest limit of the volatile matter content in this woody biomass is 80 percent and the lower limit is 30 percent. Even the ash content in the woody biomass is found to be relatively low compared to that of the herbaceous biomass. And this ultimate analysis of the woody biomass it shows high carbon content and oxygen content respectively and this higher lignin content and lower cellulose content indicates that the woody biomass has relatively lower H by C and the O by C ratio than the herbaceous biomass. And this we already discussed few slides before I will just take you to those particular slide where we compare the H by C and the O by C ratio of the woody biomass and the cellulose that is nothing but the biomass which has a relatively higher carbohydrate content and compared to that the woody biomass has relatively lower O by C and the H by C ratio because here the carbohydrate content is relatively less than the herbaceous biomass. And the next classification is the aquatic biomass. The aquatic biomass refers to any plant material that has formed in water such as seaweed, microalgae, water hyacinth, etc. Macroalgae are multicellular organisms that can quickly reach up to 60 meter in length. They are mainly used for food production and hydrocolloids extraction. Whereas microalgae are microscopic in nature and it ranges between 10 to 350 micron in size represent one of the main components of aquatic microflora and one of the largest and the fast growing source of the biomass on the earth and the main product obtained from the algae are carbohydrates, proteins and lipids. Whereas seaweeds belongs to the lower plants in the sea and are quite different from land plants both in the components and the structure and in nature there are around 55,000 species and over 1 lakh strains of brackish and freshwater algae and the aquatic plants. The structural and the composition analysis of the aquatic biomass indicates that the composition of the aquatic biomass varies depending on the growth condition and the nutrients which are used during its growth period. Aquatic biomass mainly consists of the carbohydrates, proteins and lipids whereas the lignin content in the 
aquatic biomass if you see here it is relatively low compared to the lignocellulosic biomass and seaweed contained higher amount of the carbohydrates than proteins and lipids and even the lignin and some species of macroalgae and microalgae are rich in protein carbohydrate whereas few species of algae contain high amount of the lipid and it all depends on the growth conditions and the nutrient used during their growth period because of that if you could see here there is a great variation in the composition of this aquatic biomass and similarly the proximate analysis also shows here the large variation in the composition due to the different aquatic biomass species aquatic biomass can be easily dried under the sunlight so the moisture content can be reduced to around like 8 to 14 percent in the aquatic uh, biomass and this particular biomass tends to have higher volatile matter content and low ash content up to 3 percent whereas the highest limit of the ash content in this particular species is around 36 percent and these properties of this biomass makes it attractive for the various application including for the biofuel production and biochemical processes. Ultimate analysis of this aquatic biomass shows moderate to high content of carbon and the oxygen in its composition whereas the sulfur content is slightly higher in this type of biomass compared to the lignocellulosic biomass and that is mainly depends on the media composition which is used during its growth period. If the media composition contains relatively higher concentration of sulfur in its composition then these particular aquatic species or the cells of this aquatic species will uptake the sulfur and accumulate it during their growth period and which eventually reflects in its composition. Similarly, the higher nitrogen content in the aquatic biomass is mainly referred due to the higher protein contents in its composition. The waste biomass are secondary biomasses as they are derived from the primary biomass source like trees, vegetables, agro-industrial waste, wood industry waste during the different stages of their production or use. And the example includes the municipal waste, biosolids, sewage, industrial waste and various manures but from the specific sources. However, municipal solid waste is an important source of the waste biomass and much of it come from the renewables like food scraps, lawn clippings, leaves and papers. MSW also contains the combustible element which are fossil fuel derived material example the plastics and are therefore not a source of renewable energy. And this combustible fraction which is recorded from the mix municipal solid waste has been referred as a refuse derived fuel or simply termed as RDF. Even the landfills have been traditionally used as a designated area or site for disposing of such waste where it is decomposed to produce methane gas. And this composition analysis of the MSW also varies because it is a mixture of the various waste material. So, as I mentioned just before, it is a heterogeneous material which consists of cardboard material, papers, the food waste as well as the residual waste of the different fractions. So, as a result we can expect a great variation in its composition and even the proximate analysis of the municipal solid waste it shows higher content of volatile matter and ash than the other biomass material. Similarly, the ultimate analysis shows here the high content of carbon, however relatively lower content of the oxygen in its composition as compared to the other biomass materials and also the nitrogen content is much higher in the municipal solid waste and the maximum limit also it goes up to 
12 percent in the municipal solid waste. Now, if you compare the composition analysis of the municipal solid waste with that of the newspaper, so the municipal solid waste has the cellulose and the hemicellulose contained in the range of this much, whereas the lignin content is relatively less in the municipal solid waste. However, if you compare it with the newspaper, then the carbohydrate content in the newspaper is relatively higher and even the lignin content is relatively higher in the newspaper waste. So, which shows the heterogeneity of this particular mix fraction of waste material as a result we can expect huge variation in the composition of the municipal solid waste. So, these different varieties of the biobased feedstock material can be converted into either solid, liquid and gaseous fuel as a product applying various conversion processes such as physical conversion, thermochemical conversion, biochemical conversion and chemical conversion or even the hybrid conversion processes. So, the physical conversion here includes pelletization, mechanical extraction and the distillation and in this particular processes the material is just transformed from one form to the another without undergoing any chemical reformation. While the thermochemical conversion processes includes torrefaction, carbonization, combustion, gasification, pyrolysis and the liquefaction process and the biochemical conversion includes the anaerobic digestion and the fermentation processes which are very popular and widely used at a commercial scale for the production of gaseous product and liquid bioethanol as a product and the chemical conversion processes include the transesterification and the hydro treatment. So, in this module as well as in the next module we will be mostly discussing in detail about this conversion technologies. So, let us first discuss about the physical process that is a pelletization. Since we know that the biomass is a energy lean fuel the transportation cost per unit energy content of the biomass is more expensive. And therefore, to improve its energy density, biomass is compressed into a denser pellet or the briquettes of this particular form so that it improves its energy density. The pelletization process basically it increases the bulk density of the biomass by compressing it mechanically. Why pelletization? Because it converts the undesirable properties of the biomass to a desirable properties. Because if you look at the undesirable properties of the biomass, it has low energy content, high moisture content, heterogeneous in nature as we discussed just now, low bulk density, irregular in shape, hydrophobicity and requires high storage and the transportation cost. And once this material is converted into a pellet, ultimately it increases its energy density because the pelletization process reduces the moisture content to 7 to 10 percent than its original moisture content of around like even 40 percent. And even the pellets produced from this raw biomass sources shows high energy content. This particular schematic here it represents the pelletization process. This is a hopper and then it feed this particular raw material into this particular pelletization chamber and where the raw forms of the biomass converts into this kind of pellets. The pelletization of the biomass can also be made more efficient by torrefaction of the biomass before pelletization or by using the bio additives. So, let us discuss about this torrefaction and the bio additives process. So, in case of the torrefaction, the biomass is first torrefied, then cooled and grinded to required size and then subjected to the densification under high temperature and pressure. And the torrefication basically it is a process of production of the carbon rich solid fuels from biomass by removing only the early volatilized low energy dense compound and chemically bound moisture in a treatment range of around 200 to 300 degree 
Celsius and it increases the energy density of the wood from say 10.5 to 20.7 megajoule per kg by mass and from 5.8 to 16.6 gigajoule per meter cube that is by volume. So, that is what is the advantage of this torrefication followed by the pelletization process where it increases the energy density of the raw wood sample. And through this pelletization and the torrefaction that could make transportation and handling of biomass competitive to the conventional material that is coal and the net volumetric energy density it can be calculated from its HHV and the bulk density and this is basically the conversion factor because here we are converting the value from megajoule to gigajoule. So, if you just compare the fresh wood, the pellet wood and the pellet of the torrefied wood we can see there is a significant decrease in the moisture content whereas, significant increase in the bulk density even the heating value increase significantly from 10.5 to 20 that is almost like double and also the net volumetric energy density it is almost increase 3 times in case of the pellet of torrefied wood sample. And this particular schematic here it represents the pelletization and the torrefaction process because a biomass pelletization process typically consists of drying size reduction prior to the densification process and then densification. After densification these hot bio pellets are cooled. Sometimes the steam conditioning is also used for the biomass because it also enhances the densification process through the softening of this fiber because since the biomass contains lot of fiber. So, if the steam conditioning is given to such kind of raw material then because of that the fibers get softened and it helps in the pillarization process and the torrefaction typically it consists of a pre drying of the biomass then torrefaction and followed by size reduction and then densification and then hot densified pellets are cooled to obtain the torrefied pellets. So, if you compare both these processes you can see there is a great similarity exists between the basic structure of these processes because it also require drying normal pelletization process also require the drying operation. Then in case of torrefaction the intermediate operation comes as a torrefaction process here the material undergoes the torrefaction uh, process and after torrefaction again it goes for the size reduction as it has gone for the size reduction in the normal pelletization process as well followed by densification and the cooling operation. So, there is a great similarity which exists between these two processes and that is why the torrefaction and pelletization also known as top process it combines the torrefaction and pelletization as shown in this particular schematic. So, this schematic here it represents the conceptual process structure of the torrefaction. The process layout here is based on the direct heating of biomass during torrefaction by means of the hot gas that is recycled in this particular loop. The hot gas it consists of the torrefaction gas and this particular gas is recycled in this particular loop to provide the required energy during this torrefaction process. The hot gas which is consist of the torrefaction gas itself is repressurized using this pressure recovery system and heated using this heat exchanger 
after each cycle. The necessary heat for torrefaction and the pre-drying is produced by the combustion of the liberated torrefaction gas in this particular combustion chamber and possibly a utility fuel is used when the energy content of this torrefaction gas is insufficient to thermally balance the torrefaction process. So, the heat balance which is observed in the each recovery cycle is can be balanced using this combustion process here with the use of utility fuel and this process concept is considered the most promising for torrefaction of the biomass as it optimizes towards the heat integration and is considered as suitable for non free flowing biomass and waste sample and the pelletization using the bio additives here this additives basically it helps as a precursor particle to bind together and stay firm after the densification operation during the transportation and storage so that it can maintain their physical integrity. Also the additives helps to increase mechanical durability and the calorific value per unit volume and that is the advantage of utilizing the additives during the pelletization process and the natural bio additives or the binder that can be used for the manufacturing of the pellets with the improved quality includes the bio additives used for pelletizing wood sample that is lignin is a natural bio additive or you can say the binder the castor bean cakes lignosulfonate starchy material sawdust waste biopolymers proteins glycerol and gasification residue are used as a bio additives for pelletizing the solid wood matter. Apart from that the pyrolysis oil, the waste cooking oil, rapeseed oil are used as lubricants during this pelletization operation. And if you just calculate the durability, so durability here refers to the ability of the biomass or other feedstock to withstand the mechanical forces and retain its physical integrity as pellet. With the help of this simple equation, we can calculate the durability of the prepared sample. Now, if you compare the pellets prepared using the bio additives, it shows significant increase in its bulk density as well as the heating value and even the net energy density of pellets prepared using the bio additives is significantly higher and the durability found to be much higher in case of pellets produced using the bio additives. So, this particular sample represents the torrefied pellet of oat hulk with this bio additive in the ratio of 3 is to 1. And this particular sample shows the pellet prepared from the torrefied canola hull with bio additive in the similar ratio. And if you compare these two pellets, the pellets prepared from the canola hull shows significant improvement in its properties compared to that of the pellets prepared from the oat hull. Even the durability of the canola hull pellet is significantly high compared to that of the previous sample. And this particular slide it represents the technical specification for the biomass pellets and this is obtained from this particular reference. Now if you see the biomass material which is used for the pelletization process which includes the agro residue and the crop residue and the diameter here is considered as not more than. 25 mm for the pelletization and the length should not be more than 50 mm. The bulk density not less than 600 kg per meter cube. Fineness in the sense of is like 
as received basis it is in this particular range and the gross calorific value for the non torrefied pellet it is 14.6 megajoule per kg whereas for the torrefied pellets it is around 18.8 .8 megajoule per kg and the moisture content it should not be more than 9% and that is what i mentioned few slides back pelletization reduces moisture to even 7 to 9% than the original moisture content in the raw biomass sample which is around close to 30% or even 40% as on as received basis not more than even 20% and this particular parameter which is called as a hard groove grindability index it should be in this particular range but the particle size distribution it should pass proportion from 2 mm mesh size sieves and passing proportion from 3 mm mesh size sieves and this particular information we obtained from this specific source so, if you just go back to the previous table, so the pellets which are prepared using the oat hull has literally lower bulk density compared to that of the pellets which are prepared from the canola hull and this particular bulk density is as per the standard specification limit of this particular table as well which is not less than 600 kilogram per meter cube. Whereas the pellet prepared from oat hull has the bulk density of 512 which is less than the prescribed limit. Therefore, the specific suitable biomass source need to be selected with the proper bio additive to achieve the prescribed standard limits of the fuel pellets which can be further used in energy applications. With this, we will end our lecture here. In the next lecture, we will discuss about the thermochemical processes that is carbonization and torrefaction. Thank you.